Hello, I'm Rick Dykema, and I'm the bridge pastor here at Ada Congregational Church, and we'd like to welcome you. Welcome you from wherever you are, however your life has been going, however your day has been going, wherever you're watching this. We're glad that you're with us. Whether you've been part of the congregation for years or this is literally the first time you've ever encountered us, we pray that you will experience God's grace and God's peace. And no matter who you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We're a community of faith committed to doing our best to loving God and loving our neighbor. And we're committed to loving all and welcoming all and seeking justice for all. As we begin in worship, I'd like to just invite you to let's just do a simple breath prayer. And so let's focus on our breathing. We breathe in, we hold it for a few seconds, and we breathe out. And as we breathe in, we envision and we take in God's goodness. And we breathe out, we let go of some of our anxiety and stress. We breathe in, we experience God's grace. And we breathe out and we release some of the things we've been holding on to that maybe we can let go today. We breathe in, we breathe out. And that simple act can be an act of worship as we experience the breathing, the breath, the Spirit of God. Let's worship together. Welcome. Today I'd like to share some prayer opportunities for our church family as we strive to increase communication during this time when we are physically distant. We have some opportunities to share. So the first is that we are updating our prayer chain. Ruth Wawi is doing that in the church office. If you would like to be a part of a traditional prayer chain, or if you would like to receive a simple email when prayer requests come into the church office, Ruth will also have that list. Please contact her if you'd like to be a part of that by Labor Day. The second opportunity is that with our Friday emails this fall, we will be including at the conclusion of that 
any special community updates regarding hospitalizations or prayer requests or joys. So if you are currently receiving that from me, you will notice that. And if you would like to be added to that Friday email, simply contact myself, Rebecca Rixey. And finally, our prayer, our memorial garden has been beautified this summer by a number of volunteers. Thank you for those who have helped. And in the month of September, we are turning our prayer, our memorial garden into a prayer garden. There will be signs interspersed throughout the garden that will help to guide prayer. And each week, those signs will change during the month of September. So we invite individuals or families to come and to be guided in a personal time of reflection and prayer to our God. Today, we are saying a special prayer for education. It is time to head back to school, and some children have already begun. And as we see, we have the backpack symbolizing those who will be going to the traditional classroom, as well as the computer for those who will be in virtual schools at home or homeschool. One way or another, all of us are students this fall, and one way or another, many of us will be teachers this fall. And so we ask God's blessing upon us. So for our echo prayer today, it will be a lengthier prayer, but we will be praying for our community and for education. So let us join together in this time of blessing. Dear God, Dear God bless our year of learning. Bless our year of learning. Be with our college students. Be with our college students. Protect them and guide them. Protect them and guide them. Be with our younger students. Be with our younger students. Help those who learn at home. Help those who learn at home. Help those who learn at school. Help those who learn at school. Spark imagination in all of us. Spark imagination in all of us. Be with all teachers and staff. Be with all teachers and staff. Give them strength and wisdom. Give them strength and wisdom. Be with all parents and families. Be with all parents and families. Grant them comfort and mercy. Grant them comfort and mercy. As our community learns in new ways, as our community learns in new ways, bless us, O Lord. Bless us, O Lord. Amen. Amen. Climb a mountain just to speak the words we are. See the world as a father. Oh, 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 o
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts again, chapter 7 at the end and then the beginning of chapter 8. We pick up where we left off last week, where, where Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church, gets in trouble for talking about Jesus. It's threatening to the power structure. And so he's brought in before the Sanhedrin, the power structure, and, and put on trial. And he lays out the history of the people of Israel. He retells their sacred story. And he highlights how they haven't treated the prophets well. And even how they killed the prophet Jesus. And at this, the Sanhedrin is very upset. And we pick up in verse 57, where it says, At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their feet, their coats, at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing of him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all, except the apostles, were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with street, shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Here ends our reading for today. We pray that it would comfort us, that it would challenge us, that it would point us to Jesus, the very Word of God. I attended Calvin College. It's now Calvin University. It's a small liberal arts school here in West Michigan. Go Knights. And I played volleyball for a number of years there on the men's club team. And we played above our level. Uh, we got pretty good for a few years. We even beat United University of Michigan. Uh, we beat Kentucky at Kentucky. We beat Notre Dame and Purdue. We were pretty good for our little small school. We never beat Michigan State. They had a better program than us with a real coach. And uh, my son is happy about that as a state fan. But State, even though we never beat them, they weren't our rivals. We wanted to beat them badly, but, but our rival was Hope, Hope College. And for a number of years, we didn't ever beat Hope. We came close, but Hope had a guy named Pete. He was enormous, massive wingspan, and incredible vertical leap. He ended up playing professional beach all around the world on the AVP tour. And we never beat Hope when Pete was there. We beat him pretty soundly after that, when he left. But Hope was our rival. We wanted to beat them with everything we had. Those games against Hope mattered more than any other game, even if it was a championship, even if it was the University of Michigan. Hope, we wanted to, we wanted to beat them so bad. Now, if you're not from West Michigan, and you're watching this, or you were an alien and you just looked down on the world, and you see Hope and Calvin, two schools about 45 minutes away from each other, both founded by Dutch Calvinist traditions, both coming out of Dutch Calvinist traditions, and thankfully there's a little bit more diversity there now than there was originally, but, but two schools in West Michigan, similar to each other, incredibly similar to each other. And you, you look at that from outside and you think, why are they rivals? Why do they hate each other? Why are they screaming at each other at basketball games? Why this rivalry? They're so similar. They believe mostly the same things. They look mostly the same. They come from the same communities. Why the hatred? Why the animosity? They're so similar. And that's a terrific question. But it misses the point of the similarity often is the reason for the hatred 
and the animosity. Have you heard the phrase, they fight like brothers? Have you, have you seen around the world, it's, it's the people who are most similar that fight the hardest. It's, it's this, we're so close, we have to claw at each other to grab what's ours. We have, to, we have to make them other. We have to make them not like us. We have to be superior, so we have to put them down. We see that in lunchrooms. We see that in business rooms. We see that in the scripture, and we see that in our lives. Rivalries, hatred, animosity, even though we have so much in common. The story we read this morning in the sacred text is a story where Philip goes to Samaria, the Samaritans. The Samaritans and the Jews had incredible amount of things in common. They shared about the same text. They both had the Torah. They both worshiped the same God. They worshiped on different mountains because each one had to claim that theirs was the real one and the other one wasn't. But they were so similar. Same ancestry, slightly different. One thinking that the other is polluted and they thinking that the other's ancestry is polluted. And so much in common, so much similarity. They lived on the same land. If you were a Roman citizen who traveled to Palestine in that day, you would think they were the same thing. You wouldn't understand why the hatred. They, they don't mix. They literally hate each other. Why? It doesn't make sense. They're so similar. And yet hatred. Three of the four Gospels do not include any stories of Jesus traveling through Samaria. A number of them mention Jesus intentionally going around Samaria, mirroring what Jews of that day did if they were going to walk from Jerusalem to Galilee, like walking from here to Big Rapids. They wouldn't go 131 straight north. They would go all the way to the lakeshore, walk 40 miles out of their way so they wouldn't have to walk through uh, Samaria. The Gospel of John does include a story of Jesus going through Samaria, though. He goes and he stays, he sits at a well. And a woman comes to that well in the middle of the day and is drawing water. And Jesus asks her for a drink. And she's appalled. Who are you? You're going to talk to me? Jesus was violating all of the conventions of the day. She's a Samaritan. He's a Jew. They don't talk to each other. He's a man and she's a woman. They don't talk to each other. He's a rabbi, a religious leader, somebody important. He doesn't talk to women, and yet Jesus does. And Jesus blows her away by telling her about her life. And she says, I can see you're a prophet. I can tell that, that you are important, that you know things. So tell me, which one is it? Is it your mountain or our holy mountain where we should worship? And Jesus doesn't bother with, with these theological questions about differences. He just tells her, I am the living water. She has an encounter with Jesus and it changes her life. She runs back into town, tells everyone, and this town is changed. This Samaritan town is changed because of the Jew, Jesus. Jesus tells a parable. We call it the Good Samaritan. We think the Good Samaritan is you, you pop a tire on the highway and somebody stops and helps you change it. They're a Good Samaritan. So Good Samaritan has kind of a, a good connotation. You know, we think Samaritan is a hero. No, oh, the people Jesus is telling that story to, the context of that day, Samaritan. <sighs> Samaritans. And Jesus tells a story where, where the Samaritan is the hero, where the Samaritan is the one who is loving and caring and shows empathy and care for his neighbor, as religious people didn't. He indicts the religious, the powerful, the important, and he lifts up the Samaritan. The Samaritan who, who shows mercy and kindness. And so in the narratives about Jesus, we see that Jesus is flipping things. It's this upside down kingdom that Jesus is bringing. It's new. It's different. It's not the way society sees itself. It's flipped. He flips the script, you could say. And so then we come to this story. And Philip goes to Samaria. We see great persecution, and so the church is scattered. We'll come back to that in a moment. But Philip leaves, like Jesus said they would. You'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, and Philip goes to Samaria. 
And it says those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Philip goes to this place where Jews don't go because we hate them. They're, they're, we, they're so different, even though really they're so the same. But that emphasis on difference, which is so ingrained in us, which is so taught to us and pushed on us to emphasize the difference, Philip breaks the social norms like Jesus did, and he goes to Samaria, and he brings with him the story and the spirit of Jesus. And the area is changed, just like the area was changed when Jesus came there a few years earlier. And so Philip goes because Philip is sent. Now why, why is Philip sent? Why wouldn't they just stay? Well, it comes in our story, doesn't it? While they were stoning Stephen, it says at the end of chapter seven, where we left off last week, while they were stoning him, they laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul. So here's this character. Saul is introduced to this narrative. Saul, who becomes one of the major characters in the rest of this book, at this point is a passive bystander. He's standing there and, and people throw their coats to him so they can throw these rocks and execute this man. Capital punishment in the name of protecting the religion, protecting the social order. Here's this person who's blaspheming, who's, who's talking in ways that are threatening to the system. He must be put down. And Paul isn't the one throwing stones at this point in the story. He's holding the coats. He's a passive bystander. But we imagine, we, I think it's fair to infer that he agrees with this. He's just not the one throwing the stones at this point. And it says, and Saul approved of their killing him. Literally the next verse says, and on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. And so here we have Paul, Saul, sorry, his name changes later to Paul. I keep making that mistake. So Saul began to destroy the church, it says in verse 3. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Saul, defending the social order, defending the power structure and the systems, has the tools of the state at his disposal, has the tools of power and system at his disposal. And so he's going house to house, and there's threats, and there's violence, and there's even incarceration, prison. This prison system is in place to attack the church. It's used to attack the church. And Saul is persecuting, and so the church scatters. And as I, as I thought through this sermon this week, scattered with a purpose is what rose to the top as I think through, how do we make sense of this? The church is scattered, but scattered by whom? And scattered for what? From Saul's perspective, they're scattering because they're scared, because he's doing what he should do. He's, he's persecuting them, he's putting them in prison, he's killing them, right? The people in power are putting down this change, this transition, this new thing that's happening. But from our perspective, from Luke's perspective, as we read this book, we can see that Jesus predicted that they were going to move, that this wasn't a movement just for Jerusalem. This wasn't a new religion or a new kingdom, the reign and rule of God, God's presence poured out just for Jerusalem. This is for the world. So Jesus talked about, I'll send my spirit and you'll be my witnesses and you will go. And here they are going. Now who's doing the scattering? Is it Saul or is it the Spirit of God? Can it be yes? Can it be both and? And why is the scattering happening? Is it, is it just for self-preservation to stay alive or is it that God's using this painful time? God's using these trials, that God's using this time that didn't make sense to them in the moment but makes sense when they look back. Could that have something to say to us today? In this time that does not make sense to us, as I stand here in a sanctuary without all of you, 
Could it be that God is doing something that will make sense years from now or weeks from now? Is there good that can come of this, even though this isn't great? So the church scattered for a purpose. A couple of questions that I wrestle with. Was Saul doing something wrong as he persecuted the church? In his mind and in the mind of those in power, he was doing what was necessary. He was protecting them. He was protecting their identity. He was protecting the social order. He was protecting the sanctity of their religion, their purity, their distinctness against this threat from outside, this change. Paul believed that he was just, righteous. He was doing justice. He was doing what was right in the name of God. He was working on God's behalf, using God to defend what he was doing. And yet now we look back, we look through this perspective of Luke and the early church, and we go, what are you doing? God's Spirit is moving in your midst, and you're actively resisting it. But that's what systems do. That's what institutions do. We have to be so vigilant to not be caught up in that. Who among you, who among us has been othered? Who do we think of as they and them? Who do we think of ourselves as better than? Thank God we're not like, oh, like the Samaritans. In the coming months, we're going to hear a lot of that. Thank goodness we're not like them, those people, those fill in the blank, immigrants, Republicans, Democrats, Trump lovers, Trump haters, all of these things, right? All of these ways that we divide. We get our team and it's against the other team. And, and it's really, for what? Who benefits from that division? Who benefits from sowing the seeds and giving us lenses that help us see how different we are and how horrible they are and how great I am? Why is that so ingrained in us? Why is that so given to us from outside? How can we take off those lenses and see the other with God's eyes? Who is the other in your life, in our world, right now? in the next few months, in the next few years. And then as people who are part of systems, as people who are part of a church, which is part of an institution, which is carry some power and some weight in the world, how can we stay so focused on God that instead of shutting down change, instead of pushing away things that might actually be God's spirit moving, that we can embrace those things instead of hold those things back? as we try to defend how it's always been. This is how it is. This is how it always will be. It's how it should be. But should it? Can we come to some of those conversations with humility? As we try to look to where is God moving? In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of some isolation, in the midst of elections, in the midst of in-person and virtual school, and in the midst of staying home alone, and all of it. Could it be that God is moving and can we have eyes to see that movement? Are we aware of the Spirit of God? May we see with God's eyes. May we not focus on the differences and the division, but may we see the humanness, the shared humanity, the image of God created in each one of us. May we see us when we look at them. Because there is no them, there's only us. May it be so. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. upon you. make his light shine in us and look after us. May the Lord look kindly on us and give us peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and every day. Amen.